distinguished guests who might be hiding in the hall, but we have three senators from Canada here today, Senator Wilfred Moore, Senator Terry Mercer, and Senator Jean-Guy Dagenet, and two members of the House of Commons, um, Wayne Easter and Brian Mass. And as mentioned before, we have Andre Boisclair, who is Quebec's Delegate General in the United States. So let me introduce this next panel. You have the full biographies with you, but First, uh, Stephen Melodic is Vice President for Business Development with Hydro Quebec U.S., where he was responsible for energy marketing opportunities in the United States. David McMillan is Senior Vice President, Marketing and Public Affairs for Elite, whose companies include Minnesota Power. Tony Clark is serving his first term as Commissioner on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, having formerly served as Chairman of the North Dakota Public Service Commission. And finally, Richard Caperton, Director of Clean Energy Investment at the Center for American Progress. Each will speak for about 10 minutes, and we will conclude with a discussion with you. So, um, Stephen is going first. <coughs> We're not doing the podium. Okay. We don't have room. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's not there, I guess I won't <laughs> use it. <laughs> it's terrific. And this, uh, this advances us. Yep. Terrific. All righty. Uh, thank the, I'd like to thank the organizers for, uh, for putting this event together. I think it's, uh, it's extremely important and very timely. And, uh, and thank you for allowing me to participate on the panel. Uh, again, I'm Steve Molodetz. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for uh, Hydro-Quebec U.S. We are Hydro-Quebec's U.S. Uh, business Development and Marketing Arm, and we are located in scenic Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I thought it might make some sense to start off with a <clears throat> another map that shows the province of Quebec uh, to give folks a, a handle on not just the location but the sheer size of the province. <clears throat> so as you can see there, it's in the northeast corner of North America that's outlined in the blue. Uh, the province is roughly two times the size of Texas. Uh, it's covered 12% uh, of the land area is water. So we are blessed with a tremendous hydropower resource. Uh, which we began developing uh, as a company about 50 years ago. Uh, the province borders Vermont, Maine, uh, New York, uh, and New Hampshire. <clears throat> so here's a, a Hydro-Quebec uh, generation snapshot. Uh, so that, again, is the province of Quebec, more or less in the middle, and those blue dots represent our hydro projects. Uh, the, the bigger the dot, the bigger the project, I'm told. Um, so. Um, that's our system. You see uh, a vast majority of the hydro is located in the northern portion of the, pro of the province. Um, we operate uh, a system of over 41,000 megawatts of generation. 98% of that, of our energy, comes from hydropower. So as a province, less than 1% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the electricity sector. Uh, I think that's is compared to roughly 30 or 32% uh, for a typical U.S. state. Uh, we are a winter peaking system, <clears throat> um, so that means our peak load is, is during the winter months as, as opposed to our southern neighbors in the New York and New England systems, which are our primary U.S. markets that are summer peaking. Um, that provides us the, uh, the benefit of having uh, greater uh, surpluses available to sell to those markets during their peak times. Uh, we supply roughly one-third of the energy supply needs for the state of Vermont. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we recently renewed that agreement with a 26-year uh, agreement between our company and a consortium of utilities in the state of Vermont, uh, where again, as was mentioned earlier, hydropower is recognized as renewable. Um, for New York uh, and New England markets as a whole, uh, depending on annual conditions, we supply roughly between 5 and 10 percent of their annual energy needs. So we have 60 hydro generating stations, 26 reservoirs. Uh, and those reservoirs provide us with 175 terawatt hours of annual energy storage capacity. We've also got about 1,200 megawatts of wind on our system. That's provided through independent power projects. Uh, the government has initiated a program a number of years ago uh, to encourage uh, wind development, and the goal is for 4,000 megawatts of wind by the year 2015. <clears throat> uh, we are directly connected to four major northeast markets. Um, so as those arrows indicate, we are directly to connected to Ontario, New Brunswick, uh, ISO New England, and the New York ISO. Uh, and in sum, that's roughly 7,000 megawatts per hour of export capability. 
Uh, we've estimated, I think this number is between 2008 and 2011, uh, that we have avoided roughly 53 million me metric tons of uh, GHG emissions uh, by displacing fossil fuels in those markets. <clears throat> We're currently involved in two high voltage transmission projects from Quebec into the U.S. Uh, the first is a 1200 megawatt project between Quebec and New Hampshire called the Northern Pass Transmission Project. Uh, that's in cooperation with our partners at Northeast Utilities and NSTAR out of Boston. Uh, again, it's a 1200 megawatt high voltage DC. Uh, they, they, being Northeast Utilities and NSTAR, will build it and own it and operate it. And Hydro-Quebec, through a subsidiary, will fund it uh, through a cost-based tariff. The second project is a 1,000 megawatt high voltage DC between the province of Quebec and New York City. Uh, this project is being developed by an independent transmission uh, company, very um, creatively named Transmission Developers Incorporated. Um, <laughs> So the project is called the Champlain Hudson Power Express, which is a little bit more creative. It's predominantly underwater as it goes under uh, Lake Champlain and under the Hudson River. Um, so they are, uh, unlike um, Northeast Utilities, not a regulated utility, but an independent transmission company. But again, uh, they will create a tariff um, for the project, and we are proposed to be the 75 percent anchor tenant, which means we will hold 75 percent of the rights, uh, assuming those agreements come to fruition, for 750 megawatts. And the other 250 megawatts will be uh, available uh, on the open market through what's called an open season. Um, so both of these projects allow us to do uh, more of what we already do, right? We're going to deliver more power, uh, more energy, more capacity uh, into the U.S. markets. We'll lower greenhouse gas emissions. We'll reduce market prices. We'll dampen price volatility. Uh, we'll increase the diversity, the fuel diversity, simply by not being natural gas. And I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Uh, and we'll increase the security of power supply by simply adding two more interconnections to a 40,000 megawatt system. We see the value of our product increasing in the coming years. So the, uh, the graph on the upper left, uh, as a couple people mentioned, that's, that's, I think that happens to be New England, and it's showing their uh, renewable portfolio standard. So New York and most of the uh, states of New England have a renewable portfolio standard that requires uh, retail suppliers to have a portfolio uh, of increasing um, renewable energy over time. Uh, and clearly along with that legislation comes a definition of what is renewable uh, and currently hydropower from Quebec is not in uh, either New York or any of the New England states other than the previously mentioned Vermont. Um, so as this graph shows, uh, the stacked bars are, are, are fairly aggressive assumptions regarding uh, their expected build out for the New England region as a whole and the blue, I believe it is, line is showing uh, their goals they set for themselves over time. And as you see, even with these aggressive assumptions, uh, in roughly 2017 or 18, they're going to fall short of their goals. So uh, should any of the states or, or uh, the larger states in the region choose to um, amend their legislation and, and decide that hydropower is, in fact, renewable, we think we've got a product that, that can help them get there at the least cost to consumers. The graph on the, on the lower right, uh, that's a pie chart. Uh, again, I believe that's New Engl the New England market, not New York, New England combined. But I think the, the, it, it's roughly the same in both those markets. And it's showing the, uh, fuel, uh, the um, generation supply by fuel type. Um, so the large uh, blue pie is natural gas, which has gone from uh, about 15 percent in the year 2000 to over 50 percent today. Um, so uh, that's due in, in large part due to the influx of shale gas in the region, which has increased supplies, which has dr driven down price and due to the fact that it's the least cost uh, fossil fuel uh, project to develop and site. So while the, uh, both New York and New England markets have, have benefited from this low cost natural gas in terms of gas prices and the result on electric prices, uh, there are some reliability uh, issues, especially in New England. The gas pipeline system was built out uh, much prior to this, um, this uh, ramp up in the gas consumption. And as a result, uh, it's really inadequate uh, for the uh, uh, gas supply needs for generation as well as uh, non-generation needs. So especially in the winter, uh, the New England market uh, can tend to run into some reliability problems as many of the uh, gas uh, generators rely on uh, non-firm gas contracts to supply their gas. So again, we see our product um, 
uh, increasing in value uh, here in the market simply by not being gas and helping them diversify their fuel supply. <clears throat> so interestingly enough, uh, at the same time we see our, our product increasing in value to the regions, uh, market conditions are making it a little bit more difficult for us to integrate uh, further into those markets. Why is that? Well, first off, as I mentioned, the low gas uh, prices, which drive low electric prices. That's uh, challenging the economics of our two transmission projects, right? There's less revenue from those markets because electricity prices are lower and expected to be lower into the future. And secondly, because the mechanisms to promote uh, the benefits that, that we've all been discussing here today uh, for hydropower don't really exist. As we've all said, uh, large hydro uh, does not currently qualify for the state uh, RPS programs. A uh, federal RPS program has yet to materialize. Uh, incentives to promote fuel diversity uh, not only don't exist, as far as I know, they haven't even been discussed. And then finally, uh, to date, uh, the efforts uh, to fund transmission on a regional basis, either for economic purposes or public policy, policy purposes, uh, have yet to be successful. So again, the only transmission that's getting built is either for reliability needs and it gets regionalized in the system, or it's participant funded as the two projects that Hydro-Quebec's involved in. <clears throat> so here's a couple things uh, we put together that we think uh, folks ought to think about uh, going forward to address these issues. Avoid the either-or mentality. And uh, some folks, uh, the ambassador, uh, I believe, mentioned this earlier. Um, th the notion that one uh, renewable technology is going to crowd out another. So everybody uh, in the wind and solar uh, markets are so concerned about getting their piece of the pie uh, that they're afraid to give one inch to allow hydropower into that market for fear it's going to gobble up something that they need. Uh, when if I think if we'd all look, and as, as we've all said earlier today, um, to achieve the goals we want to achieve in renewable and clean energy, um, it's an all-in approach, right? It's not one renewable technology displacing another. We need them all. Uh, avoid technology and uh, geographic discrimination. We found it's real easy um, uh, for states and regions to favor technologies and the location of those technologies because they tend to favor their state or their location. Um, so for that, I would say, let's let the science decide what's renewable, and then let's let those technologies compete uh, on, a, on a level playing field. Uh, don't design incentive programs to achieve multiple goals. Uh, this is sort of related to the previous point, but we see a lot of programs where um, the region uh, that the program's in, the particular state, is really interested in renewable energy and economic development. So you tend to skew things where they think there's going to be green jobs or they think there's going to be uh, property tax payments or they think there's going to be this or they think there's going to be that. I, uh, we think you end up with suboptimal results. I think if, if we stick uh, renewable energy programs to the single goal of, of incenting renewable energy, we'll end up with a more optimal result. Uh, finally, include the cost of transmission. Uh, by that, I really mean two things. One is uh, many of the renewable sites are, are um, located, especially in New England, for example, the, the, probably the next tranche of renewable energy that's going to come in for both New York and New England is going to be in remote regions. So you've got to include the cost of that transmission when you're doing the analysis to see which uh, renewable technology is more economic than the rest. You can't leave out half the equation and think you've done a thorough job. And secondly, by that I mean uh, there's a lot of uh, folks who like to use the phrase cheap uh, hydropower. And uh, one of the things, and, and when they're making decisions on whether or not a technology needs to be incented, we'd encourage you to look at the cost of the hydropower, which uh, in our minds isn't cheap and is very site specific. But when you do that, you've also got to include the, the cost to get that uh, hydropower to the load centers uh, when you're making a determination of whether uh, incentives are appropriate or not. Uh, in closing, I'd like to say uh, Hydro-Quebec intends and HQUS intends to be a valued energy partner for the Northeast. We see a number of challenges uh, that I've just described in the presentation, but at the same time we see uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the state of Connecticut is, is currently doing a review of their RPS program. Uh, where they're specifically going to consider uh, the inclusion of Canadian hydropower. Uh, we think FERC Order 1000 offers some promise as a good step in the right direction. And we think the U.S.-Canada partnership is just too valuable to overlook on this all-in approach that we think we need to take. Thank you. Thank you. And next up we have David McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to uh, hopefully give you a little flavor on a, a practical level and drive home a couple of the points that uh, we've heard both from Premier Selinger and uh, from my colleague here from, from Hydro-Quebec. And uh, to do that, I want to start out by giving you a little flavor for our utility, its customers, its geography, the economics, the policy environment we work in, how we're transforming our generation fleet over time from a utility that was 5 percent uh, hydro and 95 percent coal in 2005 to one that uh, is moving quickly toward a much more balanced portfolio, how that fits in here, talk a little bit about our partnership with Manitoba Hydro and uh, why that makes so much sense to us from both a power supply and a power delivery standpoint. And then lastly, uh, pick up on a couple of points you've heard uh, here about the positive outcomes that a uh, coordinated combined complementary policy um, direction can have from both an operational and economic and an environmental standpoint. So again, uh, my utility is the one that, uh, that I have the good fortune to, uh, to work with is uh, Minnesota Power and its parent company is Elite and what I've got here is a little snapshot of where we're, where we're engaged. Um, we've got two vertically integrated utilities, those two up around Duluth and Superior there a uh, coal mine out in North Dakota that serves a mine mouth uh, lignite plant from which we get some of our power and a uh, very, very substantial wind farm that's growing from zero megawatts to uh, 400 out in North Dakota over the last uh, four and a half years. And then we're also a minority owner of uh, American Transmission Company. So we play in a lot of uh, spheres there in our little neck of the woods up north. Um, why are we unique and why is it uh, worth me talking about our customer base? I think I can say without a doubt we are probably the most price conscious utility in the United States. We serve a greater concentration of industrial customers than any other utility and uh, well over half, close to 60 percent of our customers are uh, of the, uh, the very, very large variety and I got a couple customers with nine digit power bills. So when we make decisions about where we're going with our resource base, they have to be economic, they have to make environmental sense, and they have to make operational sense. So we're not, uh, not quite so big as, uh, as my friend to uh, my right here at 41,000 megawatts. We're just shy of 2,000 megawatts, but again, a, a, lot, a lot of very, very large customers. And uh, what that drives then is one, a sense of uh, price competitiveness, and two, um, we have the highest load factor of any utility in the country, pushing 83%, so meaning 83% of the hours in any given day, month, or year, our, our loads are at or near their peak levels, so it's, a, it's an interesting system. And uh, we sit atop the, uh, the Masabi Iron Range and also some burgeoning and uh, grow, or not growing, but uh, very substantial deposits of copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, gold, which aren't being mined now, but uh, have the potential to be. So again, economics of power supply drive the economics of mining operations and ore processing operations, so we have to stay competitive. Um, again, in a North American context here, the uh, Masabi Range provides the vast majority of the ore for uh, most of the uh, U.S. and Canadian steel mills, uh, both uh, sides of the border there. You can see some of the places where the ore that's uh, processed on, on our system ends up. Um, we're in the midst, as I said, of uh, transforming our fleet from one that was 5% coal and 90, or 5% uh, renewable and 95% coal back in 2005 to one that is about 20% renewable today as of uh, New Year's Eve that just went past and 80% uh, coal and headed for somewhere in that 50-50 range, realizing that uh, we've got to be a little more flexible, more divest, not more diverse less emissions and a little bit less uh, you know, investment in capital costs that can live with us long after uh, we'd like them to. And in the process, we're going to remain affordable, stay reliable, and uh, remain and become more environmentally compliant. How do we do that, you might ask? How do you make such a transition there? And uh, without getting into the details there, as we move from that 595 piece on the left side of that slide to the circle, we envision ourselves by about 2030 being about uh, one-third coal, one-third um, natural gas and uh, market purchases and about a third renewables in Manitoba Hydro and our connections and uh, interface with our friends to the north is critical to uh, us uh, executing that vision. But the guts of it, how are we going to do that? Very significantly look west for wind and what you've got on, the, uh, the, on that page or that, that left side of the slide 
is as you look at the darker blue being the uh, most significant uh, and mo the best wind resources, um, that little strip that comes down in Commissioner Tony Clark's state there is uh, the middle of North Dakota, west and northwest, north central North Dakota, and that's where we're putting our wind and connecting it via that high voltage DC line that uh, we bought from a cooperative partner and bringing that into our load center in northeastern Minnesota. If you, you can't read the fine print there, but this is high quality wind. It's uh, pushing north of 45% capacity factors, which is really, really, really good wind. And it uh, makes a lot of sense to do it there. I wanna stop here and just mention a policy outcome, a policy focus that my colleague mentioned is, you know, don't dictate where to do stuff. It's fine to dictate doing some renewable, but if we had to do all that renewable in Minnesota, where, load fa where, where capacity factors for wind barely get to 30, maybe 35% down in the southwest corner of the state, but up in our neck of the woods, uh, they're not gonna get to 30 most of the time. That's a whole different economic outf outcome for our customers than being able to tap a 45% uh, capacity factor resource. So just a, a little infomercial there, it's important. We'll get it done, but uh, when we're told where we've gotta do it and when we gotta do it, sometimes customers and the rates they pay suffer. So that's a big piece of uh, moving ourselves from uh, a highly coal dependent system to one that's more diverse. A second and equally uh, strategic and interdependent piece of this strategy is to look north. Uh, Minnesota Power is the only utility that's interconnected, only U.S. utility that's interconnected to both uh, Manitoba Hydro and Ontario Power Generation, or OPG. So we utilize that. We're much more dependent and much more interconnected with Manitoba, but uh, we don't. Uh, we, we do do quite a bit of uh, annual transactions with uh, with another Canadian province as well, and uh, that's going to be the capstone of our ability to uh, to move forward and diversify this energy supply. So let's look at what we're doing there. I've already uh, mentioned the wind piece, and Premier Selinger mentioned this again, but. Uh, we're looking to be at just north of 600 megawatts when we fully utilize the capacity on that existing DC line. That stuff, uh, there, that wind is coming in at just shy of three cents a kilowatt hour with the recently extended production tax credit. So uh, that's a big deal, but at that price, it's a pretty good benefit for those great big mining customers that are buying uh, you know, two and a half million megawatt hours of energy a year. It makes some sense. And that is where we turn to meet most of Minnesota's 25 by 25 mandate, which means 25% renewable supply by uh, 2025. As you can see, we're at uh, 20 now and headed for 25 using that wind resource. And here's the most important point of what I've got to, uh, to talk about today. We signed in, 20, in 2011 a uh, 250 megawatt purchase power agreement with our friends at Manitoba Hydro, Scott Thompson and Dave Cormie, and their colleagues who are in the room here to purchase that power from beginning in 2020 through 2035. And uh, basically a CO2 free base load resource that complements those wind resources I've just talked about better than anything else I can possibly imagine. In fact, I like, I gotta be careful, I don't sound cute in using this phrase, but it's really the holy grail of renewable energy, putting those two together because, and uh, let, me, let me show you this now, the system really works, and I've heard this term a few times today, now if I, I would call it a battery, but with my Canadian friends, it's a battery. So uh, it is a, a wonderful battery, and uh, one that we wanna rely on substantially going forward, and uh, it's more than just a battery in the physical sense because when our loads are low and uh, we don't need wind generation, we can move power north and uh, they can store it. When our loads are high, we don't have that wind generation, we can call on Manitoba Hydro to deliver more energy than they otherwise would. So it's physical in the sense of, uh, of uh, the ability to move power north and south, provided we get the transmission built. It's also got an economic banking provision in it whereby we can, we can essentially set up a bank account and as long as we've bought all the megawatt hours that we're obligated to buy at the end of each year and they've sold them all, we can take that in very, very differential amounts, month to month, week to week, day to day, and optimize that system, our system, from an operational standpoint. That is a big deal. We call it a wind storage provision. And it was a big part, um, this is important as well, in gaining the Minnesota Public Utility Commission approval for this uh, transaction back in February of 2012. So this deal is done in the sense of everything but transmission. So 
Let's talk a little bit about uh, transmission. We weren't uh, terribly creative here, but uh, we came up with a new line, a name there, called it the Great Northern Transmission Line. And I don't know if we got, uh, if we asked Jim, uh, James J. Hill or not before we did that, but uh, anyway, you can see the little, the route, the route isn't that important, but uh, coming down into, uh, into uh, northeastern Minnesota there and ultimately connecting up with some lines that folks want to get built in, uh, in Wisconsin as well. And uh, what I'd mention here is just think north-south in terms of transmission and federal government support for transmission. Uh, we tend to think east-west all the time, and uh, a couple folks have mentioned that today. Most of this right at routing and siting work is obviously local and done at the state level, but uh, you will see us going forward with this with our state regulators here in April. And, uh, and I know my friends at Manitoba Hydro are working on their pieces north of the border. So last point and try to bring all this home, what you've got here is a graphic up on top shows our growing loads over time with the, uh, the, the right axis there in terms of the gigawatt hours we sell. On the left axis is our, uh, is our CO2 emissions over time. And you can see us coming down from some 11 and a half million tons of CO2 as we take action with some older, smaller coal generators to either convert those or close them, retrofit our largest, most efficient coal generators, and, uh, and then bring Manitoba Hydro purchases onto our system. You see us driving that number down under 9 million, substantial almost a quarter cut in the total. And uh, here's where the policy piece comes in now. If, due to transmission limitations or unfriendly policy, we were unable to effectuate that Manitoba Hydro deal. The only other way we could probably back up that, that, that wind, even as efficient and, and good as North Dakota wind is, would be to go to gas combined cycle. And what that has then as an outcome, if we did that instead of, instead of uh, baseload hydro, is we end up uh, emitting more carbon. So you can see that uh, illustrated on this graph with about 600,000 tons of uh, annual CO2 emissions that we'd like to avoid and uh, do use the, uh, the Canadian resource as the perfect, again, holy grail complement to uh, wind resources. So we think that uh, we're bringing a lot of parts of the puzzle together here, grid reliability, operational uh, creativity, and uh, excellent environmental outcomes while still being able to meet the competitive, globally competitive price needs of uh, big, big, big power users. So I'll uh, pass this along and look forward to some questions later. Thank you very much, David. <coughs> now we'll turn to Tony Clark, Commissioner Clark. <coughs> Thank you. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I probably out of um, as much as anyone who's had the opportunity to to serve on FERC have an appreciation for the interdependency, especially from an energy standpoint, of Canadian and American resources. Most of that comes from the 12 years that I spent on the North Dakota Commission. Um, I've only been on FERC about six months, but I spent um, more than a decade on the North Dakota Commission, and you can't help but but be a North Dakotan and understand the interdependencies that we have between these two nations. I mean, not only is my home state the Peace Garden State, which actually is a place, it's a beautiful park that uh, commemorates the longest unguarded border in the, in the world, um, but you see every day the, the trade interdependencies that, uh, that the two nations have. Perhaps the most important interdependency that North Dakota has with Canada is the steady stream of hockey players who, <laughs> who come down to play hockey in Grand Forks for the University of North Dakota. Uh, these young men get a great education, tuition free, and North Dakota gets, gets to beat Minnesota regularly in <laughs> hockey, which in North Dakota we call a win-win. <laughs> something I'm sure Dave McMillan, who serves on the Minnesota Board of Regents, would agree with. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about my role as a federal commissioner today and then draw, step back and draw a little bit on the experiences that I had on the State Commission in North Dakota to talk about some sort of high-level issues and then uh, just wrap up with a few concluding thoughts that I'd urge all regulators to think about as, as we think of some of these issues. I've stressed a number of times and, and throughout my confirmation process that I, I've never viewed my job as a federal 
regulator of being one where I'm attempting to pick winners and losers between generation resources. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, the way that, that energy is regulated in the United States will understand the distinct differences between a state commission and a federal commission and how it's very bifurcated uh, uh, energy jurisdictions that we have. But from the federal level, I've never felt that it's my job to, to pick those winners and losers between generation resources. Now, that's a little bit different than my own job, old job at the state, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a moment. But rather, uh, the FERC has a number of important responsibilities. Primary among them is to ensure that we have functioning wholesale markets. So what it does mean is that we're trying to create some sort of level playing field where all resources have the ability to compete in a fair way. Um, and that we have appropriate price signals that are being brought to bear in the, in the wholesale energy markets. There have been a number of initiatives that have taken place over the last few years that, uh, that FERC has done some uh, since I've been there, some uh, predated me by quite a bit, but that will have an impact on the ability of all resources, including resources like Canadian Hydro, to uh, compete in the marketplace. Of course, things like Order 755, frequency regulation, if you have fast ramping uh, uh, resources that are able to meet frequency needs, there will be an ability going forward to have some of those capabilities recognized in the marketplace. Um, although I don't consider hydro necessarily a variable energy res uh, resource. The Commission has been doing a lot of work on VERS, variable energy resources, intermittent resources like wind, and certainly this issue of pairing comes into play with regard to that. More about that a little later. And then a, a major order that the Commission is in the middle of uh, vetting through right now, which is Order 1000, and it was mentioned here a little earlier. Order 1000 does a number of things. It, uh, but primarily, if you get to the heart of it, it's about planning and transmission planning and how uh, uh, future planning for the transmission grid will be taken into consideration. Some of those issues are pending before the Commission right now, and of course I can't talk about those, but uh, others, it, it's primarily the, uh, the, what we call the intra-regional filings are being dealt with right now. Inter-regional filings, which are a little bit broader geographic areas, are due uh, a little bit later. But all of those things are examples of activities where FERC, through its wholesale and, uh, and transmission um, jurisdiction, is taking steps that will have an impact on the ability of things like Canadian Hydro to compete in the marketplace. And of course, the other, one other major area for uh, the Commission as it relates to electricity is with regard to reliability. And it, I think, always bears mentioning that while FERC and NERC, which is the uh, uh, reliability coordinator have a close relationship. NERC is not National Electricity Reliability Corporation. It is North American Electricity Reliability Coordination we, uh, Corporation. We have a, a, uh, a, a jurisdictional relationship with NERC at FERC, but we also understand that it is much broader than the United States when we talk about uh, reliability, as we've learned throughout history. These are not events that are located just in, in necessarily one country, and actions that happen across the North American grid can have cascading effects elsewhere. Let me step back now and talk just briefly about my old job on the North Dakota Commission where, uh, as I said, you really did see every day the interdependency between the two countries, not only on the electric side, of course, but on the pipeline side where we'd be pipelining CO, uh, siting, uh, CO2 pipelines to go into the Weyburn oil fields of Canada or, uh, or other pipelines through the, uh, through the Bakken. Um, as it relates specifically to, to hydro and electricity, I would say that we had a, a commission and a staff that, was, that tended to be very focused on cost above other issues um, and tended to take a fairly conservative approach to how we would analyze some of these resources. In fact, I see Chris Morrell, who used to work for me at the North Dakota Commission, now works for a new congressman here in Washington. Welcome, Chris. Um, and it was a commission of staff that really did look at, at costs probably primarily above, above other issues. We had ex exposure to these types of issues, not only with Minnesota Power, who was citing projects in North Dakota, but uh, also with our investor-owned utilities that we were actually regulating. The North Dakota Commission does not economically regulate Minnesota Power. It does regulate other utility companies that operate in, in both states like Excel. In vetting through these resources, we found exactly what, what David talked about, which is that if, in many circumstances, if you could pair a hydro contract, which the Commission would have to approve, 
a hydro contract with some other resource, you ended up with the best of both worlds and competing just on the basis of cost. This is not a state that has a renewable energy or an RPS. It has a goal, but it doesn't have an actual mandate. Just competing on cost, we were able to find that it was a good deal. Um, and so we entered into a number of those, those contracts. What I would, stepping back just a moment, stress to regulators and I said this is a little bit of a difference between federal regulators and state regulators. State regulators, if you're in a, a still vertically integrated monopoly, IRP, integrated resource planning type state, you can't say I don't pick winners and losers. You actually are picking winners and losers if you're in that situation. You as a regulatory commission are, are validating what a utility is doing or not validating that. Um, there's some rules of the road that you should be aware of as you enter these decisions about what resources you're helping your utilities pick. One of the things I would say is you really need to focus on the bottom line cost and ensure that you are not falling prey to some of the syndromes that I sometimes have talked about in other speeches, which is, for example, what I like to call the ribbon cutting syndrome. There can be a desire from policymakers, be it regulators, state legislators, governors, congressional leaders, whoever, to, to have this desire to, to to have that ribbon cutting, have that resource be built in their state and better yet in their term of office so they can have that ribbon cutting and say, here's the whatever, the wind farm, the coal plant, the gas plant that's opened on my watch and here are the 15 jobs that have been created. And so you can make public policy choices that, that maybe tilt towards wanting to have that, that ribbon cutting in your district, but maybe tilt against the consumer interests in your state. It might be not the cheapest resource, it might be for parochial reasons brought in, but a more expensive resource. The problem with that is you may be able to point to those 100 or 50 jobs that are opening up because that generation plant is opening up, but no one sees the 1,500 manufacturing jobs that, that, that flee from your state over the next 15 years because you now are less competitive than your neighbors and in a, in a global marketplace, perhaps your global neighbors. It's the same problem we have with lots of public policies where the, the, the benefit might be precise, but the pain is, is diffuse. I think regulators and policymakers in general need to be aware of that and instead keep at the forefront the notion that while it's okay to like certain resources and while it's okay to like and, and especially if you're an elected official and I was for most of the last 20 years, it's okay to like these things happening in your term of office. Don't put those likes above the pocketbooks of your consumers because there are some ancillary uh, problems that come about when you do that, and that's something that I think we all need to keep in mind. I think these resources can compete on a cost basis, but it has to be done state by state and, and utility by utility. But I would say give all resources within your state, outside your state, um, potentially internationally, a fair chance, but keep in mind what the bottom line cost is to your consumers, and then you'll be doing well. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Richard. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks for organizing this and thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's good to be on a distinguished panel here at the Wilson Center. Um, I guess one of the problems with being on a distinguished panel is that many of the things I was going to say have already been said. Um, all the hockey jokes have been told. Uh, the holy grail uh, phrase has been used. Uh, you'll see maps in my presentation that you've seen. Uh, the policy recommendations you've already heard. So. I'll, uh, I'll do my best to, to keep it somewhat brief so we can get to the conversation, but also to say something um, potentially interesting uh, and talk about, you know, why, uh, why aren't we using more Canadian energy if it is so great? Uh, what tools can we use to, to use more? And what are, what are the real barriers we have? Um, for those of you who don't know, the Center for American Progress is a nonpartisan think tank here in Washington, uh, founded by John Podesta, Bill Clinton's chief of staff in 2003. Um, on the energy team, we primarily work on climate and clean energy issues. Unlike uh, somebody who's a commissioner at FERC, uh, we actually are comfortable with picking winners and losers, uh, as long as the, the winners are the clean ones and the losers are the dirty ones. So um, we uh, really like clean Canadian energy because of that, because of the low carbon benefits. Um, I want to start by saying that one of the things that really caught me about Ambassador Dewar was his long, long list of interactions and partnerships between Canada and the United States that have had fantastic uh, environmental outcomes. And, you know, then the, the first questions we heard were about Keystone XL and that type of partnership about building pipelines across the border. 
I think the more that we can focus on these very, very beneficial partnerships uh, and the more that people on both sides of the border can focus on this, the better off we're going to be. And I think we'll ultimately find more supportive people on both sides of the border for these clean power partnerships and uh, environmentally friendly partnerships. So uh, here's my holy grail, which you've already heard. Um, moving right past that, here's a map you've already seen. Uh, Here's a little commentary on the map. Uh, I think what's interesting here is that we, uh, we talk about, and somebody earlier said that Canadian hydro makes a huge difference in the United States. That's actually not that true. Um, it's a very, very small part of our total generation in the US. Now, it's a much bigger deal for certain utilities, obviously. But across the country, we're only looking at about 1% of our electricity coming from Canada, 35 40% coming from coal-fired power plants. 20, 30, 35% maybe now coming from natural gas, 20% from nuclear, but only 1% of it coming from Canada. So there's, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, but the problem is that you know, building new power plants, no matter where they are, is hard, and finding markets for those is hard. Uh, we already, actually, this is another thing we've talked about already, but there are some barriers to, uh, to building generation, and it's not just Canadian clean energy. It's all sorts of generation is tough because of low demand growth, because of cheap natural gas, because of uh, uncertain environmental um, and climate policies. And then there are also some policies that make it uniquely challenging for Canadian clean energy. Um, the problems with transmission siting. Uh, Hydro-Quebec is seeing this now, especially with the Northern Pass line. Um, those, are, those are hard to cite. Uh, there's this ribbon cutting syndrome that Commissioner Clark talked about. That's a threat to domestic jobs, a threat to jobs in your state, and that's real. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. There are environmental concerns that exist to this day with Canadian hydropower. Uh, we see it uh, much less so with Canadian wind power, but Canadian hydro does raise concerns for a large number of people in the U.S., and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then there are also these regulatory barriers um, about state RPSs and federal clean energy standards and, and how they count um, Canadian hydropower. Now, I think uh, we should be clear about what exactly that means. Um, if we did count Canadian hydropower in an RPS, uh, we would most likely see Canadian hydro competing with U.S. wind and solar, uh, and that's a, that's a net, or that's a zero-sum game, uh, unless we increase the total target for the RPS. So we need to be sure that if we include uh, hydropower from Canada in RPSs, uh, that we're doing it in a way that displaces dirty energy. Again, uh, being clear that we pick the right winners. Um, so let's do a, a little bit of a case study here just to talk about, um, and this is something we've already talked about here too, uh, the Champaign-Hudson Power Express uh, transmission line. It's going to bring hydropower from Canada down into the United States. Uh, it's cost effective. It's low carbon. Uh, it's relatively easy line to site uh, because it's underwater and underground. But there are some challenges with it. Uh, and these are uh, very, very vocal uh, within the state of New York. The first, again, is this ribbon-cutting syndrome. Um, this is from State Senator George Maziars, who's the, the leading opponent of this line, who just says that, you know, we want to build generation within the state of U New York and not in Canada. Um, I think the last sentence here is, we don't need a job creation program for Canada. We need one right here in New York. And that's a, that's a real concern. Um, that's fairly widely felt up there. Uh, the way you know that he's not talking about renewables and that he's not talking about building wind farms or solar power or, or even in investing in energy efficiency in New York is that his policy fixes to this are to assess a tax on the, on the transmission line or do some other sort of funding mechanism to build coal fire and natural gas fired power plants in upstate New York. Uh, that would be a bad environmental outcome, although it might be a jobs winner for the state of New York. Uh, the other thing that would lose, of course, is these, these hidden jobs that Commissioner Clark talked about, which are people who benefit from low power prices. So um, this, this uh, obsession with local job creation is, is big and needs to be taken seriously. Um, the other thing here that is, uh, you hear a lot of with this power line in particular is that the power it's transmitting in New York is not as clean as people want to believe. Uh, this is from the Atlantic chapter of the Sierra Club. It just says uh, they characterize the power as environmentally destructive uh, there at the end there. So, um, you know, the, this opposition is fairly strong. I don't think it'll actually stop this line from getting built, especially because 
there's a lot of people in support of the line. And these are people who recognize the benefits of Canadian energy. Uh, these are, you know, some environmental groups, uh, New York Leave, uh, New York LCV. Uh, it's some economic development groups. It's a lot of U.S. representatives, obviously, uh, local opinion leaders, and then, um, in a very self-interested way, Hydro Quebec is also on the, the list of supporters. So, for it, but to step out on a limb. So uh, with that, I just want to uh, close with a few comments about how to move this industry forward. And the first is, you know, let's, let's be clear that we, we have about 4,000 terawatt hours of, sa of sales in the United States this year. We'll have about that much next year and about that much the year after that. And probably 15 years from now, we'll see about the same number of sales. So any new power that comes from Canada is going to be at the expense of some other industry. Um, there will be winners and there will be losers if we import more. So Canadian energy needs to not fight on being good, but actually on being better than alternatives. Uh, and if you, if you fight on those terms, then you can win. Um, and I think there are two, two parts to that. The first is selling the benefits. Uh, we've heard all these before, but it's about reduced emissions, both locally from uh, the local air quality around coal-fired power plants and globally with climate change. It's about reduced power prices uh, in the places that get the power, uh, either because the hydropower is cheaper than whatever power is available on the market, that's the New York City example, or because they have places like Minnesota where they need the cheap balancing resource and it's a cost-effective way to, to integrate wind. And you know the uh, the comparable environmental benefits of hydropower, whatever they might those impacts might be in Canada compared to the the other environmental benefits from climate change. Um, and finally, you also need to address the challenges which aren't made up. Um, these are around jobs and economic development, and we need to make sure that hydro complements and doesn't displace uh, other renewables that people really like. Uh, it's about siting for transmission, which uh, I think Order 1000 is going to go a long way towards that, uh, but also state regulators need to be aware that, that these can be really good investments for their consumers. And finally, on this regulatory and legislative side, um, we do, I think, want the state RPSs to count all renewable energy. But it's important, again, to, to up the target for the RPS when you do that. And same at the federal level. If we're going to have a 20% federal RPS, let's make it 25% and go ahead and include uh, Canadian clean energy. That would be a, a winner. So um, I will leave it there um, and look forward to the conversation. But again, thanks for hosting this. And thanks for the, the great conversation. <laughs> we're a little shorter on time than I had hoped I was going to ask for a little bit of conversation up here. No, 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 not you guys. We got wait on the first panel. But um, one thing that uh, I never really thought about, and I probably should have, is the whole role natural gas has played, particularly in the last couple of years, and how it's really changed not just the way we fuel power plants moving away from coal to natural gas and what we're dealing with gas in other uh, places in the country, but how it's affected at hydro. And I just I just had that observation. I want to throw it out to one of you, one of you people, to you know make some comments on it. Maybe Tony is a commissioner, or <coughs> Richard. Well, I mean, gas has changed the world with regard to energy in um, worldwide, but especially here in the U.S., where the shale revolution has taken hold faster than anywhere uh, anywhere else. And so, it is having an impact on all other resources. Of course, the the, the one that it's having the biggest impact on right now, I would argue, is probably traditional coal resources because at the same time that a lot of new environmental regulations were coming on uh, down the line and regulators and the electric utility industry were waiting for the next big thing to, to handle that baseload generation that was, was, um, was threatened by the new environmental regulations this shale revolution just fell into our lap at exactly the right time. It's much cleaner environmentally, and from a cost basis alone, um, those signals were, were pointing you towards natural gas. Now, it's also having an impact on renewables, hydro being among them, but solar, uh, wind, and, uh, and other renewable resources because it's just so much cheaper than, than anything else. And so, to a degree, I think it's going to depend on the circumstances in your particular region, which is often the case when we talk about electric resources in this country. You have uh, very different regions with regard to the, uh, the mix that is available to them. Some regions are more likely than others to become um, more dependent on gas. In a, I would, I would estimate, however, though, in a 
in a region that may be dominated by utilities that are still regulated by their state commissions, they may have more opportunity to have some diversification of their portfolio by virtue of the fact that they have to go through, for example, an integrated resource planning process where diversity as a as a good in and of itself is something that a state commission can take into consideration. If you're in a, a fully restructured state, a fully market uh, region, that can be a little tougher to get at because the price signal every day, at least for right now, is telling you build gas, build gas, build gas every time. Um, I don't think we should characterize cheap natural gas as a negative at all. It's, uh, you know, we should, we should smile when we think about cheap natural gas. It's been good for electric rates. It's been good for people heating their homes. Uh, it's helped displace dirty coal and made environmental regulations much more affordable. It's made it easy to integrate renewables in, in states that have renewable portfolio standards. Uh, they actually haven't seen their rates go up, and I uh, expect that that's because they have cheap natural gas to balance the renewables. So the, those lower power prices have been a great benefit. So uh, it's a huge opportunity with natural gas, and we need to make sure that we use it responsibly, uh, that we don't overbuild natural gas capacity. Uh, so that we miss our climate targets in the future um, and that we don't lock people into using a, a variable priced resource uh, or a resource with a lot of price variability uh, that ends up hurting them when gas goes back to you know six dollars at least but hopefully not twelve dollars in some weird months and we're seeing that today in New England where sometimes natural gas is at 25 and 30 dollars on the spot market so uh, a lot of challenges there okay questions Go to Kurt. <coughs> yep, it's coming. If you have difficulty understanding me, I apologize. I've just come from the dentist and my <laughs> jaw is still swollen. Uh, my name is Joe Dukert, and for most of the past 20 years, a little more than 20 years, uh, I've been investigating the pluses and minuses of North American energy interdependence across the board. Uh, I'm interested not only in the U.S.-Canadian relationship, but also the U.S.-Mexican uh, and the Canadian-Mexican. Uh, I have an asterisk I'd like to add uh, to um, Mr. Caperton's comment about reliability and then ask the commissioner a question about reliability. Uh, you mentioned quite appropriately that uh, the amount of electricity that's exchanged between the U.S. and Canada uh, is not all that great uh, when compared with uh, our national usage. Uh, but I'd like to point out that uh, uh, if, if a glass of water doesn't amount to much uh, unless you're dehydrated, uh, and uh, uh, the importance, uh, perhaps the greatest importance, of our relationship with ele and electricity with Canada uh, is that uh, uh, it, it, provi it provides backup uh, there, there are seasonal exchanges, which are very important. Uh, and so uh, I, I wouldn't want people to get the idea that just because it's 1%, uh, it, it's insignificant. My question uh, to, to the commissioner uh, uh, actually uh, uh, goes more to NERC than to FERC, but perhaps you'll comment on this. Uh, the, the connections are primarily north-south. Uh, but... Uh, the, po the, the reason this works is because the U.S. has a lot of east-west connections. Uh, and uh, my, my question is, uh, would you care to comment on, on how reliability for both Canada and the United States might be affected if Canada decided to develop more east-west links? Uh, and uh, I, I, there, there's a term, an electrical term I always forget, but I think it's... Uh, uh, it's not reflexive power, but it's something, something reactive. 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 Yeah, reactive, reactive power is important. So would you care to comment about whether or not, as Canada develops a national energy strategy, it ought to think more about east-west links in its own territory? Boy. Um, Probably not the right guy to ask an engineering question of, as my staff will um, often attest to, but which I think it really does come down to an engineering question about the, the specifics of the grid itself and how it operates. I would say, generically speaking, however, that from a reliability standpoint, when you have more transmission, as a general matter, more transmission is better than less. You have a, a less tight system. You have a more liquid system, so that when 
events happen, and they will happen, that you have contingencies available to pick up the load and so that you don't have you don't have to enter into a load shedding situation and you don't lose voltage. So conceptually, I understand what you're saying. How it works in practice, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't looked into that or, or heard anything about it, but um, certainly within reason, understanding there can be too much of a good thing. But generally speaking, um, more transmission on the system will make it a more reliable network than less. <coughs> Silence rained and they all got <laughs> wet in the back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Leahy from the National Hydropower Association. As we were talking about, there's been a lot of policies put in place for renewable energy development as renewable energy, but we haven't seen uh, in the U.S. for U.S. hydro or for Canadian hydro a lot of policies put in place for things like energy storage or the grid reliability benefits that were talked about. So can all of you talk a little bit about what could be done at FERC in the states in Congress? to provide a value for those benefits that hydro provides, because right now not, it's not uniform across the United States that those uh, benefits are getting the value that we would see more developers propose more, de more hydro development. i just say very briefly two things that, that come to mind are things I just had mentioned a little bit in, uh, in my opening comments, which are there, there are some open proceedings and compliance filings that are going on right now with regard to uh, uh, frequency and uh, high ramping resources, fast ramping resources in response to frequency events, and then with variable energy resources as well, which can serve as a component to that. And I think as we see these compliance filings come in, you'll, you'll start to see some of these, as you said, a recognition of the value that different resources can bring into the, into the marketplace. I was going to ask about, oh, over here? Andrew Soto with the American Gas Association. I appreciate your comments about the, um, natural gas and, and gas electric coordination. One of the things that the Commission has been dealing with is, is how to price fuel supply uh, adequacy. And, and I was wondering from all the panelists, uh, there are a lot of components about reliability and, and how they get priced into the market. And, and, and what are your thoughts about how to, uh, what's the, the cheapest way to improve reliability of the system when you consider uh, not only the source but the transmission to it, uh, obviously cheap uh, natural gas, but then the, the pipeline infrastructure to bring it there, uh, cheap, clean, uh, hydropower from Canada, but the electric transmission uh, to bring it to the to the to the load center. H how is how the pricing rules do you think need to change in order to incentivize uh, not only uh, inexpensive reliability, but uh, some of the other social policies about clean and and um, uh, interdependency, et cetera? Well, I, I could take a, a quick crack at it. I can tell you what um, uh, ISO New England is is taking a look at addressing this issue through their capacity market. So they've had a situation over the years where capacity is essentially generation uh, being paid to be there in the event it's needed, right? And through the energy market, you get compensated for the actual energy you deliver. But there has not been much of a, uh, a role that the ISO played in what happens when capacity is called upon and doesn't deliver. So you're at a system peak or a high load area, there's other generation out and it's called on the capacity doesn't deliver. So they're now uh, entering a phase where they're going to relook at their entire capacity market where there will be severe penalties <coughs> for generation that gets paid to be there and then doesn't show up when it's called upon. And on the flip side of that, for more reliable resources that do show one called upon, that's where those payments go. So from a consumer perspective, it'll be a zero-sum game. The penalties will be the bonuses. So that's how they intend to address it. So if it's a, if it's a gas generator that doesn't have sufficient fuel supply or su fuel supply contracts and therefore can't deliver during the system peak, they're going to get penalized through the capacity market. David? Yeah, I'd agree. At a, at a macro level, I'd say that the absence of any capacity market. Uh, MISO has one of the most sophisticated ancillary service pricing mechanisms. They're very good across the realm of that, but there's no real desire, there's no real impetus to get a capacity market started there, and they've looked at, uh, at PJM and some of those. 
I think that's important, and what it takes is a lot of coordination in an area like MISO where you've got a lot of states, as Commissioner Clark referenced, that are fully vertically integrated. A lot of resource planning state regulators don't tend to like to let go of that oversight process and send it off to a regional transmission organization to do. So there's some give and take and push and pull there, but until capacity gets is worth more than 50 cents a, a kilowatt month, you know, it, it's a tough it's a tough call on some of these things. So that's the macro observation. I'm not enough an expert to get into the specifics, but I know ancillary service markets and things like that have worked reasonably well in MISO to pick up some of that backup reliability cost. So I think uh, there are two things there. First is we need a price on carbon to deal with the, the clean side of things. That, that seems fairly obvious to me. The second is, is we think about more and more markets, um, adding more things to the ancillary services markets, adding, you know, creating yet another capacity market in New England for natural gas pipeline capacity for electric providers. Um, I would not be surprised at some point if states didn't re-examine the, the premise of deregulation and go back to uh, regulated utilities. Um, just recognizing that at some point we've got 100 different markets for every tiny thing. Wouldn't this be easier if we just had a state commission setting the prices and deciding how to do things? It, um, I think as others have suggested, it really is, it depends on what sort of region you're in. If you're in New England, restructured states, it, within a market, the answer that they seem to be leaning towards is this notion of, of a penalty for not showing up, which basically then will price that into the market because a generator won't be able to get by on the cheap anymore, where they may bid into the capacity market, get the capacity payment, but then not actually show up on the day that it's, it's, uh, it's needed, which does seem to me to defeat the purpose of a capacity market, which is effectively a reliability product. So if they're required to bid in their true costs, eventually then you would expect that through that capacity payment process, you will get things like more pipelines being built, which is really the answer for New England in the long term, is to, to reflect a model that allows for pipeline capacity to expand in a region that's very constrained and desperately wants more natural gas to come into it. If you're in one of these other regions which are dominated by state utility commission IRP planning, the answer there is much more direct. You have uh, some sort of planning process, and if you need firm capacity, the state commission simply tells you build it, and then there's a mechanism to recover that through rates. Hello, my name is Marguerite suazo golay and I'm with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, this question is for Mr. Caperton. You said that in order to be able to have increased hydroelectric capacity coming down from the Canada to the US, Canada needs to sell it as better, not just good. And I was wondering what are some ways to suggest that Canada does this? This can be for any of the panelists. Um, I know uh, Premier Selinger said before that uh, you know, they sell it as sustainable. Um, they're working with the First Nations. What are some ways in which you can market Canadian electricity as better, not just good? Um, I think the climate impact is the biggest thing you can do. Uh, and then it, beyond that, it starts to depend on the alternative you're displacing. If you're displacing uh, very, very expensive natural gas power in New England, then you should be talking about electric rates and the, the cheap the affordability of the power. Uh, if you're in different parts of the country, you should make sure that you market it appropriately uh, given those markets. But the climate benefit has got to be one of the leading points. I'd, uh, I'd add one thing and that is that I don't think it's always a displacement not to argue with my colleague here but uh, we've uh, made decisions to eliminate some smaller older inefficient dirtier coal and uh, so there isn't any displacement there of that um, we are it's complementary we w we have enhanced and accelerated our development of North Dakota renewables because of the presence of that Canadian hydro opportunity so it doesn't always have to be a head-on competition I think there's a lot more complementary and secondly I think uh, the Canadians probably need to do uh, to amp up the amount of time they spend talking about the value of the energy resource that they bring to a market like MISO every day. Now, it's true, the megawatts, the capacity measure that Mr. Caperton spoke about, 1%, isn't much. But the impact that, that Manitoba Hydro has in a market like MISO, where they can move hundreds of thousands of megawatt hours into and out of the market at any given time, because of the kind of system they have is dramatically beneficial to end use customers. So just having the ability to generate it there and then moving surplus energy south is a big, big deal. We've studied that, I don't have the numbers at hand, but they have an impact of driving down market prices most of the time in a market like MISO that's well interconnected. <coughs> 
of the things, I'm not an expert on this, and <coughs> working in the Canada Institute on a lot of different topics, you get to learn a lot of different things, but on this, uh, one of the things that jumps out is me, and I'm a complete novice on this, really. I'm not, if I were, I'd probably be commissioner with you or something. <laughs> but um, the whole concept of transmission <coughs> comes up to me. This uh, is an issue. You've got these resources where they are, and they're not always where we need them. I mean, you think like, I think of wind in Texas and stuff, and you, it's not really, it's not in suburban Dallas that you have the wind farms. Um, so how do we get, or is transmission really a problem for <coughs> getting the resource to the market? Um, I mean, I noticed that the uh, slide of New England there with the Sierra Club and the New York Senator talking about, well, you don't want them here. And there is opposition to building transmission. And there is opposition to building pipelines, as we know. So is it a problem, or is it really can we get this stuff done because we need to and we will do it? Um, I, I'll take a shot at that. I, I think that's a great question. <coughs> and the problem that we're running into quite a bit with our two transmission projects <clears throat> is we're not finding an appropriate venue to discuss the benefits that these projects bring. So most of the conversation, and, and, and we don't mean to give this short shrift, it's a very important issue, are the siting issues, right? It's going to come through my property or near my property or through my state, and what's in it for me, and I don't want to look at it, and is it overhead or underground, and how are you going to build it, and how high are the towers, and how wide is the right-of-way, and all those things that are tremendously important issues, but it's just one slice of the issue. Right? And there's, there's very limited venue to discuss the benefits that these projects bring. And it's, and it's almost, we're finding our partners are almost embarrassed, you know, to step forward and say, yeah, but think about the great things this project's going to do because they've got someone whose property value is, is at issue or they've got someone whose home, uh, you know, is at issue. And, and so it, it's, it's, we're not finding an appropriate regional venue to say, but, but look at the, um, you know, the, the fuel diversity benefits this project will bring. We're Keep going on the, ben on the benefits. Right, right. We're, in, we're, in, we're bringing Champlain Hudson Power Express to New York City. That's a load pocket. The governor of New York has made no secret of the fact that he'd like to shut down Indian Point nuclear reactor that sits just outside of New York City. This is a key component that could help him do that. Um, something like 70% of the generation that's in the city of New York is natural gas. So this is bringing in a resource that's underground, underwater, that's going to that's, that's gonna be not gas. Um, it is controllable by its nature. Hydropower with a reservoir, and certainly when combined with high-voltage DC transmission, is very controllable. So to the extent you want to integrate wind into New England, a project like the Champlain Hudson Power Express is ideal for that. But market mechanisms need to be created such that that's, a, that's an economic uh, opportunity for, for the sellers. Um, it's it's um, the, the, the benefits and the list goes on and on, the reliability benefits. ISO New England and New York ISO in private conversations will tell you they love both projects. Publicly, they can't say a darn thing, right? They're, they're the independent system operator. They can't anoint one project and say this is a great thing. But when you've got an entity outside the region that's willing to fund transmission, that's going to bring in a hydro resource and connect their system to a 40,000 megawatt system, they love it. It, th their operators love it, their planners love it, but, but there's no venue for them to say that. So is that the same in less dense parts of the country? <clears throat> well, I think the siting and routing issues are always there, perhaps not as, uh, not as significant. We're going through, you know, much less populated parts of the world in, in, in northern Minnesota, but uh, the lack of a good comprehensive venue, a place like this, to have this conversation is is trouble, the, you know, and Commissioner Clark mentioned that the integrated resource planning environment creates a little of it, but it's still disjointed because there's a certificate of need proceeding to get the routing done, or before you can start the routing, and the IRP process is going on over here. So it's hard to find the right comprehensive universal environment where you talk about what is this doing, good or bad, for the region. Did the feds do that? Well, I mean. There have been a number of initiatives, um, not necessarily led by FERC, but uh, recently that have attempted to get to this question of planning for broader regions. And we talked about Order 1000, which is, deals with a portion of that. But for example, the last few years, uh, there's been an ongoing project regarding interconnection-wide planning um, through the, the eastern interconnection. The West has had a bit of that in the past, but they've continued to, uh, to, to do that with some uh, ERA grant funding. But the EIPC, uh, in particular is related to eastern interconnection planning in a way that has not happened in the past. The idea being attempting to look at different scenarios in a more holistic fashion where if you just look at, for example, the transmission component of something, 
uh, a, a particular project, you might get a very stilted view of what the end use cost to consumers is. In fact, what you need to do is look at different scenarios and focus in on what's the actual end retail consumer cost going to be, understanding transmission is a portion of it, but it's only one portion of it. Generation is another portion of it that needs to be taken into consideration. Different load pockets and constraints can come into effect, which, which uh, can uh, different, differentiate pricing in different regions. So it's a, it is attempts like these to get at answering that question, what is the optimal mix of generation, how close should it be or could it be, and then interjecting that transmission piece, which is, of course, important to hooking up uh, resources when they're geographically distant, like hydro often is, or like wind often is. Okay, I'm going to ask each of the panelists <clears throat> to wrap up with a sentence or two on what we need to think about and where to go next. And then we'll start down here. David? I think I just want to reiterate the, uh, the complementary nature of this, that uh, we're accelerating U.S. and adding U.S. renewables by, by partnering up with, uh, with Canadian hydro opportunities here. That's uh, yeah, I guess I'd sum it up by, by one of my previous remarks, which is let the science determine what's renewable and then let the technologies compete on a level playing field. Um, there are people who don't like Canadian energy, and we should be clear about who they are and how they stand to benefit from the status quo. <laughs> uh, I'd say uh, what I've reiterated in the past, which is uh, focus on end-use consumer cost and, and doing what's right by your consumers. Well, please join me in thanking the panelists, and thank you for coming. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Up in Montreal? No, they were in Montreal. Where were they actually? Looking at opportunities.